Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Sorry we're a few minutes late again uh, this time around, but that's okay. It's still these growing pains. This kind of a steep learning curve for me anyway with Google Hangouts. Uh, so welcome anyway, everybody, tonight for uh, My Moon and the Cosmo Quest X uh, Google Hangout. Uh, we, My Moon has been teaming with Cosmo Quest past couple of months, maybe two, uh, to, to do these webcasts live, uh, bringing people in to talk about the moon and, and things related to the moon, uh, science and um, exp exploration. Uh, my name is Andy Shaner. I'm with the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston, Texas. And with us tonight is Leo Camacho, who is the uh, media and, uh, well, I'm sorry, outreach. <laughs> media and outreach. Specialist. Yeah, Something like that, guy, <laughs> for uh, for the Google uh, Lunar X Prize. So we're going to chat with him uh, tonight about GLXP. Uh, so a reminder to everybody: uh, if you want to uh, leave a comment or have a question uh, for Leo, uh, you can you know, do that. If you're watching on the YouTube channel, you can do it in the YouTube comments there. Uh, you can also do it on the event page uh, for this webcast on the My Moon Google. Google page, and you can also use Twitter. Use hashtag MyMoonLPI, uh, like you see in my uh, name, lower third thing there. Uh, so anyway, uh, without any further ado, let's get started. So welcome, Leo. Uh, I'm glad we could have you this evening with us. It's nice to be here. Um, so just just to start off, just tell us a little bit about what it is that you do uh, with the Lunar X Prize. Uh, what don't I do? Uh, <laughs> it's it's an interesting role uh, to be sure. Um, Actually, the, the Google Lunar X Prize team isn't actually quite as big as everyone would imagine. Uh, uh, Google's a big company, and the X Prize is a big competition, but actually running the core of the, of the competition itself, um, there are only five to seven of us, depending uh, on, the, on the day that you ask. And um, my primary role is media and outreach, so I, uh, I take care of all the social media, all the team interactions and their media, all the web um, content. Um, you know, I help curate and create some of that content as well. Um, I also do some of the design, and I help uh, graphic design, um, some of the web design as well. And then I also assist with all of the educational uh, outreach programs, which right now is Moonbots. Uh, so I've got my hands full at any given time. Uh, and, and, of course, I do uh, things like this. I show up at podcasts, and I go to events, and I interact with the general public and the media alike and uh, spread, the good, spread the good word. Awesome. Um, to, to actually... Tell us a little bit more about Moonbots. From what I, from what I understand, it's like a Lego uh, robotics competition. Uh, but but tell, tell us more about that. Well, uh, it's, it's kind of based a, a little bit around the first robotic league, um, the first Lego league, uh, where you know, kids can build robots and they go to competitions and can even make it into international competition. So we kind of took that and, and created a sort of in-between program when they're not competing officially that they have something to work on that they can kind of learn about the Google Lunar X Prize and learn about the Lego Mindstorms NXT kits uh, that Lego produces. Basically, they can learn build the robots physically, obviously, uh, but then they also learn some basic uh, programming so that they can move up into the higher ranks of robotics, uh, like First League. Uh, so essentially what it is, it's kind of uh, the way we call it, the GLXP for kids. Uh, we give them certain missions. Uh, last year was actually a, a set of missions, and they had to choose to address uh, a number of them and uh, pick themselves challenges of surviving the lunar night, challenges that would just be faced and imposed to you if you were exploring the moon. Then they had to create a, spe a specific robot to solve those, those problems and then create uh, an actual field for the robot to navigate and solve those. So, the, so the, prog the problems had to be built, the robot had to be built, and then the robot had to be built to solve those problems specifically. Uh, so it was really cool. You know, It really ch challenges the kids to be creative and innovative and... Um, in the process, they're solving the same problems, essentially, that our team would be facing when their robots land on the, on the moon to win the Google Lunar X Prize. So that's kind of that's where we're going with that, and now we're trying to push it out and put it into science centers and make it more of a, you know, um, a, a, a thing for everybody, a, a smaller scale where you don't have to be into programming, but you can still kind of participate in Moonbots. And that's that's kind of where we're headed with it now. Very cool. And you just, you just finished up a competition recently, didn't you, within the past few months? Yeah, yeah. Actually, the last, uh, actually, the grand prize just um, was issued. I think two two weeks ago. Um, we uh, we had Moonbots 2013, and uh, that's the one I'm talking about, where kids had to you kind of had to do some research to find out what the problems were on the moon. That's what we wanted. We wanted the research to take place. That's you know, part of the whole STEM and uh, STEM outreach. But um, uh, essentially, a team won, and they won a, uh, the first 
the grand prize was a trip to Hawaii to uh, the Pisces Lunar Testing Facility in Hawaii to actually test the rover on the volcanic soil that um, that scientists use to kind of mimic the uh, lunar regolith. So it was, it was pretty cool. It just finished up, I think. Uh, the competition was over a couple months ago, but the grand prize just was issued two weeks ago. So there should be some news on that uh, on the Moonbots website. Very cool. Um, so we, we've actually had, um, I think, three... Three speakers from three different uh, Lunar X Prize teams come on and talk in one oh, of these hangouts. Um, but why don't you go ahead and tell us again, uh, maybe for those of us that are, that are new uh, to our hangouts, what the Lunar X Prize is all about? Okay, so the uh, the short answer is the Google Lunar X Prize is uh, an incentivized competition where teams from around the world are competing to land the first commercial robot on the moon for thirty million dollars, up to thirty million dollars in prizes. Uh, that's the that's the you know, the, the cut answer, but uh, in reality, it's kind of an attempt to generate and create this sort of lunar economy uh, and, and accelerate the, you know, the advancement of, of the space industry as a whole, commercial space industry. Um, if this happens, yes, we will make history. We'll be the first commercial craft to land on the moon, but that's kind of, um, that's, that's not the, the prime objective yet. That is, that is an amazing accomplishment, sure, but um, already we're seeing kind of the... Uh, the the, 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 ter the the terrain kind of changed a little bit with teams starting to merge and uh, basically an economy taking place. Not all teams are in it to win first place. Some of them can't afford to make a lander, and so they're selling, um, uh, so they're buying space on another team's lander that has developed it already. So we just want to create something where money is is shifting around, companies are being built, and, and kind of pushing this idea of space exploration is uh, available to everybody. And, so when you say other teams are buying space, are they like for an instrument? So or? so essentially, there's there's different aspects to winning this competition. There's of course you have to build a robot that can go on the moon, uh, but you also have to launch somehow, and you have to land on the moon. The landing bit is the trickiest part of the whole thing. Um, we focus a lot of we tend to focus a lot on the robots, on the rovers, and and the hoppers, of course. Um, but but that's actually um, secondary to all the work that goes into landing now. It takes a lot of work to build a sophisticated robot that can win the prize because there are certain specifications they have to meet, like rover 500 meters, and um, uh, you, you have, they have to send back high resolu resolution imagery. So creating craft that can do that is difficult in and of itself. And then to have the funds, the resources, and the time to create a lander as well that can, you know, be ejected from a, a rocket, so to speak, uh, not crash into the moon, but softly land because uh, that's the whole pe the point. There hasn't been a soft landing on the moon in over 40 years. Uh, so it has to soft land on the moon, and then the robot has to come out in one piece. Uh, so some teams don't have the time to create that landing vehicle, uh, which is probably the most difficult part. But other teams, it, it you know possibly have a background in that, or have somehow created that, or spent the majority of their time doing that. And so, in creating this craft, they have extra space that other teams can now purchase as a payload space, send their robot up there, and effectively win second place. And and the, recently. We had a team announce that they can take up two additional rovers. So now we have real competition happening. Um, what if one team launches three rovers? Who goes out first? Who comes out second? Who wins what money? So it's become really interesting, and uh, that's something we didn't quite foresee at the beginning, but we expected for this range of surprises to, to occur. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. That's yeah, I know. It's really cool. We, we actually have a real space race again. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> Well, it, it, actually, it's interesting to, to, to use that, that, that phrase because so you were talking about the prize money. A total of $30 million that actually can get split up various ways, right. and the top team would get $20 million, if I remember correctly. But if they didn't land – $20 million if they land before a government-sponsored uh, mission successfully yeah. lands. And I believe at least – the plan, I don't, I'm not sure where this I think is India is slated to land a rover. China. China, 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 China. It's China. They're planning a landing one this year in uh, 2014. Um, I think it's going to be kind of like a kickoff to uh, the International Space Conference that's being held in Beijing, I assume. But um, <laughs> we have announced that we will not lower the price purse. That was originally the case, but um, uh, you know, apparently landing on the moon is tough. <laughs> it wasn't as easy as everybody thought. So uh, we said, you know what, you guys are still going to do this. We don't want to discourage you from continuing to pursue that prize, so it'll still be $20 million. Okay. And, and you know, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to um, uh, 
bash on the X price here. I'm just curious, how could, why twenty million dollars seems kind of low compared to the overall cost of launching something yeah. and putting it on the moon. And it's, so, it's a great prize. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I could use it a spare twenty million. Uh, yeah, in in actuality, I think um, by the time this competition is won, the I, a team can only win up to I believe twenty five million total. You can't win full thirty, uh, which would fund about. Roughly 25% of the overall mission, uh, with the launch vehicle and production, every everything combined, manufacturing, it probably will cost about 100 million to do this, and you're getting about a 25% return, which isn't much of an incentive. But the incentive doesn't lie purely in that. That's just kind of enough to motivate you to get started, but not enough to intrigue bigger companies like Boeing. Uh, to them, that's nothing. But to a small company looking for a global platform, the entry fee is free marketing for essentially what is seven years, eight years, um, and, uh, yeah, and on, like I said, on a global platform, you do get some of your investment back, which is nice, but essentially you become the pioneer and the forerunner for a new industry. So, you know, you made history, congratulations. It's kind of like a Burt Rutan, you know, he got Spaceship One, it was a successful venture, and then here comes Virgin Galactic saying, we want to buy your technology. And that's the idea, if you're in first place, second place, even if you're in fifth place, it doesn't matter, you have now created a technology that can be utilized commercially by companies looking to invest in space. Now, with asteroid mining, uh, you know, with the advent of asteroid mining being big in the news, companies are going to need some technology to get up there and do the work, and our teams have already kind of laid the foundation for that. So uh, that's the real prize, is you are launching an industry, and you are immediately one of the leading experts in this kind of endeavor. So, um, yes, $20 million isn't that much, but imagine the millions and billions and potentially trillions that come after that from space exploration. Sure, right, yeah. Um, so I just want to remind everybody, if you've got a question uh, for Leo, you can post it either on the YouTube channel. It looks like I know a few folks are watching on YouTube. Uh, you can post it on the event page for this Hangout, and you can also use on Twitter, use hashtag MyMoonLPI, uh, all one word, and you can get us your questions. Um, send them in, send them in. That way, that's right. Send them in, you don't want to listen to me ask questions for the next <laughs> 45 minutes. Uh, so I was looking at the um, at the bonus prizes yeah. um, that, that are possible, and one of them is for operating at night. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm sure this probably probably depend on the individual team that would actually go for it. So one question, first, first part of that is: there somebody that you know of that's looking at doing that? And and number two, would they get, would they would they collect data and then just sit and wait for for the sun to come up again before they were facing yeah. the Earth again to communicate, or would they try to use like LRO to communicate? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I don't know any teams that are specifically attempting it, although I know teams are attempting it. Um, but they just have to survive the lunar night. They don't actually have to operate within it. So um, I, I don't know the, the details of the communication on that, um, but I know that it is going to be attempted. I would imagine, why not? I mean, especially teams that are, that are starting, that are conducting further research for, like, NASA and that have gotten some of the, um, some other contracts. I'm sure that there's going to be some news coming out on that in the, in the near future, but at the moment I don't have any details. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think the bigger, I think the bigger one, uh, the one that's being focused on primarily is the water detection and the Apollo. Um, uh, you know, you have to visit an Apollo site and send back uh, high-resolution resolu high imagery of the Apollo landing sites, but uh, because those are the exciting ones. Surviving the lunar night is kind of like parking in the shadow, and it doesn't <laughs> generate a lot of cool news. So although they're probably going to attempt it, not a whole lot of teams have been uh, at least actively speaking about it. Okay. Uh, and Nick has a has a question. Uh, what is your favorite thing about the Google Lunar X Prize? Wow, that's. <laughs> 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 What's your favorite thing in the universe? Uh, no, so it's it's um, well, number one, it's cool to do the this right. You get to geek out about space and robots and talk about this cool technology that is really we're right on the precipice of, and uh, people are generally unaware. Um, space is kind of a, an interesting thing in that it's so far removed from anything that we're used to hearing about or, or, or talking about on an everyday life, unless you work in the space industry or already are already a fan. Uh, you don't just hear it on the streets, right? You don't get on the subway and talk about space type of thing. So it's cool to be the person that says, hey, can I blow your mind for five seconds? Check this out. Did you know? You know, and then and people are just like, what? That's happening? It's, you know, it's like bringing them to the future in one second, and that's the cool, that's the most rewarding part of this job. The coolest part is just, uh, you know, I don't know, being a fan and being brought in to do what you love, you know, because uh, I wasn't, you know, I don't have a pedigree in the space industry. I actually come from more of the entertainment side. 
uh, but I got to bring those skills over to a hobby of mine, which is space, and that's probably the best you know, feeling to know that I'm contributing to the future. So. Very cool. So, so tell us a little more about this, the, the, the entertainment background <laughs> that you come from. Well, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting story. It's a long story. It, it started all back in the MySpace days when social media, social media was uh, in its infancy. <laughs> But, uh, you know, through, uh, you know, uh, just a, a, an interesting journey, I ended up kind of just getting into social media. I eventually ended up hosting a show on kind of pop culture news and things like that. Generally nerdy subjects, movies, comics, video games. Uh, but because I am such a nerd, I was also into space on the side. It's just, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of platforms to discuss space um, other than my Moon LPI. But at the time, my show was geared around primarily video games and movies. So... Um, on the side, uh, I was over there looking at space, and then when this opportunity presented itself, I thought, wow, how cool would it be to do with what I'm already doing but apply it to something that um, I don't get to openly talk about much and kind of bring that kind of spirit of um, just entertainment, that whole, like, pop news is cool and it's happening all the time. Because I felt, you know, when I, when I came, when I first started, uh, you know, space has, it, it's interesting because it's kind of like, it has this kind of shield in front of it to the general public. They feel, they feel it's not approachable. Uh, it's too technical. It's too, too high, it's too high above me. I'll never understand it. But I'm not an engineer, and I completely understand. It. I think it's really cool, and there's awesome things happening all the time. There's videos of stuff blowing up, good and bad. But you know, there's cool stuff happening. Rockets going off, and you know, there's two space stations orbiting this planet right now that people don't even know about. And that's all you have to say. It's like, look at this is happening. This is really cool, and uh, and make it an entertainment, you know, so to speak. So I feel like that's my role in this. Is apply all those YouTube videos that I've been in and take that same kind of uh, overall feeling of, of excitement and just cool, quick entertainment bits and give it to everybody else. Cool. Well, yeah. it seems to be working so far. It's, well, so far, so good, <laughs> right? Here we are. Um, I'm going to go uh, actually uh, back to the bonus prizes topic uh, sure. for, for one more thing. There's also another one for a precision landing mm. uh, near an Apollo landing site, and I'm Kind of two parts to this. Is curious how precise is precise, or is it just whoever gets closest? If you have more uh, than one, more than one team, that's now, a really do... interesting thing, actually. Yeah, could continue yeah. your question. Yeah. Well, no, go ahead, and I'll ask the second part in a second. But go ahead. Well, it's interesting because you know there's always negotiations happening uh, with NASA about uh, the lunar heritage preservation. Um, so I, I don't remember the exact distance, but there is a certain distance they have to land outside of. And certain sites you can't approach within a certain distance. Um, I forgot which is which, but there is, um, you know, it's not law. That's the interesting, that's what makes this whole topic so interesting. There is no law. I mean, space is the Wild West. Uh, the way I like to put it is if you can get on the moon with a rifle and defend it, it's your moon. I mean, for the most part, <laughs> nobody owns it. So um, you can't really impose these, these laws. It's, they're just guidelines, they're, um, the Apollo Heritage guidelines. And so... You know, teams are asked to work with NASA, and for the for the most part, I mean, not for the most part, we do respect them, and uh, and we don't want to disrupt these these you know historical sites. Uh, but there are some that we can approach, and they actually want to know what's going on there because if for whatever reason NASA goes up there to conduct science again in the near future, there are sites that they want to specifically look at, but they can't look at every one. So they want our teams to go ahead and take that initiative, send back some data, send send back some high resolution imagery, some video, maybe you know even if depending on the craft, if they can conduct some sort of science, you know, um, send back that data. But um, as far as landing, they have to land far away because, you know, you can destroy it if you land too close. Uh, but I don't know the exact distance uh, that they can, you know, with the perimeter that they can land within. So. Okay. But, yeah, but it does pose a very interesting uh, yeah, uh, conversation when you say, well, what can you touch and what can't you touch and, you know, uh, who owns what and what's belong, you know, it's interesting. Right, and, and actually, that was kind of that was the second part of that question. Um, so, so is it the closest they land, or is it has, or can they land somewhere else and get as close as NASA says you can get, or is it actually where they physically land before they start roving? I don't, you know, that's a, that's a really good question. I actually don't know the details on that. Um, I wish I had one of my engineer uh, coworkers with me now to answer that question because that's one I've, you know, I never even thought about that uh, because I know that there was a distance that they had to land away from it. Uh, so I never really thought, are they going to land right on that rim? And <laughs> what happens if they kind of miss a little bit? Uh, so that's really interesting. Um, I don't know. I'll have to look into that more. And I'll get, get back to you on that if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah, sure. 
uh, ha ha had a question come in uh, asking, what stellar object do you think merits more exploration and examination? Oh, man. This is just like a personal, like, geek out question? Or is this yes, for it, the general so. science? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, I think uh, it would be really cool. I mean, just personal opinion, I, you know, not within budget or anything like that, speaking. Let's say we had a limitless budget. But I think it'd be really cool to explore Titan um, just because of all the potential that it holds and, uh, and because we don't really know what's going on over there. Uh, you know, if there's like a layer of ice, it could be life underneath it. So uh, I think that would be something worth looking into. Uh, but as far as what's within our current reach, uh, what's possible within the realm of applicable science, I think what they're doing on Mars is amazing. Um, but uh, I think it's tough, maybe not specifically, but just the whole idea that we're going to start mining asteroids and uh, maybe find finding one that's reachable just so we can start testing equipment and just getting out there and figuring out how we're going to start landing on these things. And I think that's really, really exciting because you can think about that happening within the next 10 years. Within our lifetime, we'll be mining, you know, astronomical bodies that are just floating around. So um, I think on from that side, I would say just like the closest, which I couldn't name a specific one, but if there's a big asteroid that's not hurtling towards us and is safe enough to approach, then I think that's where we should go. Well, because so it, it would bring money to space, right? And that's what we want. We need finances being dumped. And we need a budget so that we can continue space exploration. So, so what do you think about this current idea to actually bring this, like, about seven-meter-wide asteroid to actually capture yeah, it and bring it here and put it in orbit? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to study it. Uh, <laughs> Boy, it sounds like the uh, the premise for some sort of science fiction horror movie, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> let's see. Um, Doomsday, no. Uh, but... Um, what do I think of that? I think that's interesting. Um, I think that kind of goes back to what I was saying. If we can get out there and figure out how to maneuver these things and we can learn how to bring them in a little bit closer, uh, it's kind of a scary thought, but at the same time, it's kind of an amazing thought because, uh, you know, what's the, 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 the first imagery that comes to my mind is, is kind of like, uh, uh, like space industry, like, uh, you know, sort of like the space station, but floating around kind of an asteroid. And you can already see commerce of, you know, ships going up and coming back. And I think, the potential that holds, if we can actually learn to do that, is amazing. Uh, but it is also incredibly terrifying, too, because what if something looks wrong? Uh, I don't think we're at the stage where we can kind of make those decisions yet. You know, it's a little it's a little out of our reach, technically. I mean, we're barely getting on the moon commercially. Let's slow down on the asteroids. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I think it's cool. Like, eventually, I think that's an amazing idea. And, um, and, and like I said, it would be a reason to finance space exploration, and I think that's the biggest key here. I, I, which brings me to this point of, of kind of why, like why are we doing all of these things? Like why are we mining asteroids? Why are we going to the moon? Why are we going to Mars? It's, it's from, you know, from my experience, it's the toughest thing to answer is, is why. Space doesn't have a very clear why, and when it does, it's different to everybody. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's not truly clear, it's just their idea of clear, right? Um, you can say, yes, there are rare minerals and, and resources that can be attained on these other bodies and um, that maybe are not here on Earth but abundant out there, and that's definitely a reason. Um, you can say just for the spirit of exploration and uh, you know, expanding our reach in the universe and understanding ourselves, uh, there's the whole pioneering spirit, like going to a new world, and who knows what we'll find. Um, there's also the, the, the argument that uh, you don't know what technology will be brought out of these, these endeavors. Uh, it's always secondary, and it's never foreseen. It's just kind of an afterthought that occurs, and now we have cell phones, right? Uh, but, you know, I don't, it's, it's, it's just so, man, you know, it's... <laughs> go on, go on. Right? Right. I'm just getting, <laughs> I'm getting off track here, you know. It's just, this is, but it's interesting, because these are the things we deal with every single day. And, oh, and wow, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question come in uh, says uh, any com is, is it, so it's a question. Any company can be part of the privately funded group for this project. Uh, well, that's kind of a kind of a two part answer. Uh, originally, if you wanted to be your own team, yes, but we we are no longer accepting new teams. So if you want to be a company and be part of this, then you would have to probably become a sponsor of one of our teams or just offer them a load of money and buy them. <laughs> but. Uh, um, but yeah, yeah, you can still be a part of it. Yes, you can be a sponsor. The only uh, speculation, um, uh, I'm sorry, the only um, the only rule we have is that uh, you, they can't make 
more than 10% of the total mission funding from government. So if you're a company and you want to invest 100%, you can. Uh, there's, there's no limit to that. So yeah, you can still get involved actively. Just approach the teams and they'd be more than happy to hear from you, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually, I don't, I don't know if you want to comment on this or not, uh, but do, do you, who do you think are maybe is a team or, or teams that <laughs> might be in the best position now to, to yeah, win it all? I can't, I can't really comment on that, um, but I can say that, um, you know, we just had our, our international team summit, and I personally had to sit one-on-one -on -one with every single team and conduct interviews with them, and so I, I would say I have a very solid feel of the competition, and what I can say is a year ago uh, at the last team summit, if you were to ask me this question, I would say, I feel like there are a solid two teams, possibly three teams that are in this to win it, right? But after this year's team summit, I think teams have come to major realizations, um, uh, not only technically, but um, marketing, uh, in, in terms of marketing as well. They've really learned the value of promoting their teams. And I think now that this is becoming a little bit more exciting with the deadline approaching, uh, they're also in higher gear to get their launch contracts, but they're also realizing that this platform works. And um, investors are, are starting to raise their eyebrows now with all of these announcements, with Mars and asteroid mining. So... Uh, if you were to ask me that now, I would say a solid, um, I mean, I would even say six to seven teams. Wow. Are, are, yeah, it, it's definitely um, kind of up in the air. So I couldn't give you a one team, to be honest, because I think there are a lot of people that are, they have some uh, crafty schemes, uh, a brewin, <laughs> and they're going to, and I think we're going to be surprised by a lot of individuals. Um, teams that probably no one even considers are, are, are much higher than anybody suspects, and they're making amazing deals, and and of course, you know, there's always the, the point of view that not every team is in this to win the Google Lunar X Prize. I mean, some teams are just trying to raise awareness in their country and, and develop a space program within it. Uh, and I would say if that's your goal, uh, some of these teams are succeeding um, amazingly. I think they're the best success stories, as a matter of fact. Some are just trying to raise general awareness in space. And so success comes from different... Uh, it's, it's, it's not really tangible in this competition. If you ask every single team I asked said there is no losing when I asked them what they would do if they lose the Google Lunar Prize, and uh, nobody said you can lose it. Everyone said, everyone coming out of this, every single team is a winner in some regard, uh, either by starting an industry or starting a company or meeting individuals that have advanced their careers. There's really kind of no losing. Yes, one team will land on the moon and win $20 million, but uh, who that team is, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I, even, even if I, like... I can, you know, even if I could share with you my personal opinions, it still may not be accurate. It doesn't truly reflect the competition, in my opinion. But we are, I think, going to have a system in place soon where you can start kind of having a better feel for where the teams are, uh, and that should be coming in the next year to to our website. So. Cool. We'll definitely have to watch for that. Um, another question has come in here. Okay. Um, Let's see. Here we go. Okay. Is there any possibility that the robots could be used in deep sea exploration as well? You know, it's it's funny. Uh, these particular robots, no. I mean, they're they're built for lunar exploration. You have to kind of build them for what they're meant to do. Uh, but uh, I always use that analogy that the the closest thing you can relate space travel to is uh, is ocean exploration, and even that is so beyond anybody's reach because it doesn't come up in general conversation either. Uh, so these teams, yes, some of them are, uh, I would say most of them are capable of creating these devices, but the actual rovers themselves, no. Um, but interestingly enough, uh, you know, we uh, at our summit this year, Shell is one of the sponsors of the Exploration, X, uh, XPRIZE's Exploration Group, and um, they're starting to use some robots to kind of work with the under, underwater oil rigs and things like that. And uh, they, they came to our team to find out a little bit more about how it works. So I, I think that that is another direction that Google Lunar X Prize could end up hate heading in the future. I mean, of course, it's not something that we would make a prize for uh, within the Google Lunar X Prize. It's not like a $5 million for the team that can explore underwater. Um, but, but that technology is, yeah, you, but you're, you know, it's, it's true that that technology could spawn from this. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Very cool. Um, so I just want to remind everybody, uh, if you have a question, uh, for Leo, you can submit it either through Twitter using the hashtag uh, MyMoonLPI. You can also use the YouTube channel if you're watching it on YouTube. And you can also use the uh, comment boxes on the Google Plus page for MyMoon if you are watching it on the, the event page uh, uh, for tonight's uh, Hangout. Uh, so, Leo, having come from an um, entertainment background, what would you say is um, maybe one of the more inspirational 
moon song or video or and I'll ask you personally for you what do you think is one of the sure. well it's uh um it's it's kind of a, to ask me it's kind of silly cuz i mean i will always say star wars <laughs> you know like okay. that was hey you know what it's true that was my initial uh uh so uh entry into space i guess you could say uh i didn't even know anything about it right cuz i wasn't um uh, an orphan of Apollo. I didn't even know about any of that stuff when I was a kid. You know, it was it was the pop culture thing that really drew me towards it. And of course, now I know that that's just fantasy. It's not anywhere near related to actual science fact. And even Star Trek has the right idea, but it's not an accurate portrayal. I would say maybe one day, but not now. Um, but these are the kind of things that that get your mind out there and start thinking. And um, to be honest, uh, the single biggest um, motivator in uh, in my I guess you could say my crusade for space <laughs> came from the website Reddit. Um, I, I was an avid redditor. I was already kind of curious about space, but one link leads to a YouTube page that leads to 20 YouTube videos and a Wikipedia page, and before you know it, now you're introduced to everybody from you know Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Michio Kaku, and now here I am, and it all spawns from just kind of um, the public board. So I think that that interest exists because obviously it's a very hot topic on sites like Reddit and, and and the like. Um, so I, I would say that that's probably my single biggest influence uh, in, in, in this whole shebang. But uh, again, if you say one source of media, Star, Star Wars, I guess, because <laughs> I started that like in elementary school. So. Sure. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody, or again, I please encourage you to ask questions uh, if you if you got one. Um, I was trying to go through my list here and um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm kind of rambling. I, I tend to do oh. that a little bit. So. No, no, no oh, you're all right. You're you're absolutely fine. You're fine. This is this is what it's all about. Just letting it all out there. Um, so I'll tell you what we'll go ahead and do. It looks like um, I maybe have kind of a quiet audience tonight, which is which is okay. That uh, we, we well, it space is a quiet time. place. <laughs> I'm sorry. Space is a quiet place. <laughs> no one can hear you scream. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Leo, why don't you think for? I'm going to do a couple of things here, say a few things here, and just kind of think about what your, how you want to close. What would be your closing statement you'd want to make uh, for, for 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 people? And let me just uh, just say again, if you if you have a question for Leo again for, before we end up here, please go ahead and uh, submit that through Twitter at hashtag mymoonlpi, or through the YouTube channel, or through the uh, event page on the My Moon Google plus page. Um, just to let everybody know, our next My Moon uh, Cosmo Quest hangout will be on uh, May 7th with Matt Sheehy, or Sheehy. I'll have to learn how to say that before he comes on. Uh, he's the lead singer for a group called Lost Lander, who I believe is out of Oregon. And he's going to chat with us and talk about uh, talk about the group and kind of their their inspiration and how uh, the moon and space fits into uh, fits into their in, into their work. Uh, and that's that's May seventh at uh, seven p.m. Central. So just watch the My Moon website, uh, My Moon uh, social media, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google Plus. Watch all that for updates on connecting to that webcast. And Cosmo Quest has a learning space tomorrow. Uh, it's at six p.m. I believe that's Central. Uh, talking about the National Science, or I believe talking with somebody from the National Science Teacher Association about the Next Generation Science Standards, which are a new national science standards uh, that will be replacing, um, gosh, the standards we've had for like 15 or 16 years now, I think. Uh, pretty exciting new thing. Uh, involves a lot more of the process of science and engineering, uh, mixing it all together, which, which, is, which is great. Uh, and then the Cosmo Quest's weekly space hangout will be Friday. Uh, it's Friday at 2 p.m. Uh, Central. So, uh, Leo, why don't you uh, bring us home tonight? Yeah. I guess that's the right phrase. And uh, what would you uh, what would you want to leave people with? Well, I would say uh, kind of the way I feel about this whole thing is um, if, if you love space and uh, want to be involved with space, you can. You can do it. It's never unattainable. Uh, I, like I said, I don't have any sort of academic pedigree when it comes to engineering. You know, I have an art and design background with uh, some journalistic background as well, and I brought that flavor over to space and I think that there's a lot of gaps in the space industry that need to be filled um, that are crucial. Uh, engineers need support too and in other realms. 
they're busy doing science. Somebody's got to talk about it, you know. So, you know, it depends. It doesn't matter what you do. Um, you can bring your specific skill set over to the space industry and be involved and be active, even part time. I know for a fact that our teams are always looking for individuals to just help in any way that they can. Um, you don't have to know how to write a you know complicated algorithm. You can just help do data entry if you want to, or you can be a janitor if that's what you want to do. You know, any skill that you possess is applicable in some way to the space industry, and it's never unattainable. It's never above your head. Um, as a matter of fact, I think. I feel like when you, when you approach uh, a rocket scientist, so to speak, they're always happy to hear uh, another perspective. I feel like you get kind of closed in by people that are like-minded, and I mean, yes, it gets things done, but uh, it doesn't offer any sort of creativity or or, or you know outward uh, kind of perspective um, on the rest of the world. So I feel that if it's something that you're interested in and, and you want to pursue, you absolutely can. And I will speak personally; it is one of the most rewarding experiences that I've ever had to know that I'm contributing um, to something that generations down the line will consider commonplace but will revolutionize the way that humanity lives today and then. So, uh, so yeah, I would, I would encourage everyone to uh, just pursue what you love and if space is what you love, you know, talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Follow us online. Do everything, you know. You've got Twitter and I'm, I'm, I'm personally the one who responds to the tweets and so if you have questions or you want to be directed um, uh, in, in you know, to a team that you are personally interested in or don't know if there's one in your area, I'll supply you with that information, and I'd be more than happy to communicate with everyone out there. So follow us online, at GLXP is our Twitter. GoogleLunarXPrize.org is our website, and if you want to speak to me personally, I'm at Leo Zombie. Like I said, I'm kind of a nerd. <laughs> but I'm open. <laughs> Let's talk. Let's talk space. I love this stuff. All right. Well, actually, there's two more things. I'll go ahead and ask them right now. They've come up. Sure. Uh, Nick asked, if you could go anywhere on the moon, where would you go? If I would go anywhere, it, well, I, it, it's interesting because uh, I don't know if I could go any. I just, I just want to go somewhere in the Sea of Tranquility because everybody knows that. Everybody knows that phrase. And if I could just say, like, I was in the Sea of Tranquility, people would just be like, what would it, you know? <laughs> but if I had to visit a specific site, um, you know, honestly, I would actually like to visit the very first flag planted, first of all, to know if it's still standing, and second of all, to know what it looks like. Because uh, that's kind of like one of our hot questions and my personal favorite question is, what does the flag look like now? Uh, people have their theories, but no, nobody knows for sure. So that's where I would go, to see the first flag and see what's going on with it. Very cool. Very cool. I like that. Uh, and finally, uh, will Leo comment on the unexpected outcomes of the competition to date? Have there been any? Oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> You're opening up a whole new world now. So something really cool. Actually, I'll share this with you because this is probably one of the most exciting things that I have seen come out of this competition. And it's actually from a, um, a member that's not even part of the competition anymore. But but someone had dropped out and started their own company doing 3D printing. But they you know they started as Google Lunar X Prize team, and um, and I think they're making it more commercially available. Now you take that kind of technology, and now there's a, there's a new um, with the advent of being able to use lunar regolith as 3D printing material, you could, in theory, and this is not out of our reach whatsoever, this can be done, you could put a 3D printer on the moon, uh, use the regolith to print parts, have rovers roam around the moon, uh, take these parts and essentially start building other machines, maybe a lunar base. This isn't within the next uh, five years. Five years ago it was impossible. Now we can actually say that it's probable within the next 10 to 20 years. Um, but we can actually start manufacturing on the moon and uh, using technology that currently exists. I mean, data doesn't cost anything. You can just keep beaming data, tell robots to grab that part, put it over there, and eventually someone, as I put it, can just fly up there and feel the cracks. And uh, <laughs> and there you go. You know, the beginning of lunar commerce. So that's kind of unexpected. I didn't. I didn't. You know, I don't think anybody foresaw that happening so quickly and being such a possibility um, within this competition. So that's you know that's exciting. Okay, it is. It's it's a really it's a really cool thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for your questions tonight, and thank you, Leo, uh, for taking time out uh, this evening to to chat with us. Uh, so, for everybody, uh, this is being recorded, so we'll we'll have it up on the My Moon uh, YouTube channel um, as soon as I get to that. Um, and uh, again, thank you for your questions. Our next My Moon webcast is on May seventh. Uh, and the next uh, Cosmo Quest Learning Space is just tomorrow, tomorrow at 6, and then they have their Hangout on f uh, Friday at 2 p.m. So good night, everybody, and thanks again for, for coming. Thanks.